Hi, everybody. Tony Marcolini. Welcome to the podcast. It may interest you to know. Uh, today, I have a special guest with me today for all of uh, the, the people who love comedians. I have comedian Tommy Gooch. Let's welcome Tommy. Hello, Tony. Hello, everybody. So good to see you. I haven't seen you in a very long time. In a long time. Uh, I know. I should explain. Uh, initially, I met you through, uh, well, I think it was through my brother, but I mean, you did a, a podcast. How is my, uh, how is the painter? How's he doing? <laughs> He's doing well. Okay. Um, we'll give him a shout out. Shout out to my brother. Hi, Rob. Don't curse. <laughs> uh, and you actually worked on a pilot that I had done called Surviving Sam. So I still talk well, about it. I still talk about it. <laughs> and in an alternate universe, I want to go back because that was it. That was the one. I had the best part. I was the brother-in-law of a divorced couple. And like all good things, it's left on the cutting floor and just didn't work out. And I still talk about it to this day. Oh, it was a great experience. Uh, oh, who cares about the experience? I talk about the opportunity. It was great. We had Rob Magnati. We had Alicia. It was just great. Oh, I want to go back in an alternate universe and start again. It was great. <laughs> Richard Mavini as the judge. It was just, what a great concept. A divorced couple having to live together. And, you know, and then the brother-in-law gets along with the, with the ex-husband. Oh, I still talk about it to this day. I swear to God, it's been, what, like eight years and then six years, seven years, whatever. It was good stuff. It was, it was a funny show and it was a great cast. Mm -hmm. It really gelled mm -hmm. together very well. And, yeah. Um, and that was your, I, I want to say your first foray into doing some acting. Hold uh, on, I got a Google foray. I'm Googling foray right now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that was that was your. That yeah, was no, your Tony, you're, a, you're a lawyer, you're a former lawyer. I'm a stupid comedian here. You got to use words, you know. But yeah, that was my. Well, I've done little things, but that was something that really, uh, you know, it, it just had some legs. You know, like I said, I, I'm not being poo poo. Obviously, like all show business, things happen and things get get, get off the ground. But it, it was just, it was just. Uh, I love that the, the the concept was great. The uh, the writing was great. You know, but whatever, maybe. We're still living. You never know. Something could happen. Who knows? You never know. I always say that. Uh, and you, I mean, you've done a, a pilot as well for Hulu. Uh, yeah. Back, you know, back around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So do you consider yourself an actor or a comedian more? Which pays more? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a comedian. Listen, there's no doubt. I'm a comedian. And um, no doubt. And that's what I do the best is stand-up comedy. But um, I definitely, um, like all good comedians, we're all looking for that opportunity, you know, to exploit ourselves in other ways, you know. And I don't mean just like Saturday Night Live, anything, you know, a commercial or any any kind of your production, you know, to to exploit our abilities, you know. But so yeah. Well, I thought you, you know, you actually, I think, would be fantastic uh in any level of a sitcom you were good you know we, and i think the rest of the kids surviving sam would agree with me you were really good you had, you you know you you just had a, a, a you had a look at you and, and you could laugh and and i mean that in the ni nicest of all possible ways you just yeah, had, no, no, I, you had that perennial smirk that even when you were serious i wanted to smile thank you yeah i remember one time we were doing so it was some kind of line i can't remember it and i think it was you or maybe Mar somebody said well, how would you say it and I go, here's how I would say it. And I went blank, blank, blank. Like, good, say it that way. That's the way it is. <laughs> That's right. So, um, That's and right. Alicia, was, Alicia was so great. Alicia was so great. I mean, this lady was on All My Children. And here she is with me. And she was so sweet. Uh, oh, Alicia Minshew is fantastic. We'll give a shout out to Alicia now, too. Hi, Alicia. <laughs> oh, love yeah. So talk to me about comedy. Now, you're, you're a stand-up comedian. So you do... Typically what comedians do, you go around to different clubs and you perform. Mm -hmm. how, how do you create your comedy? Where does it, what does the creative process look like for you? Well, uh, somebody tell me, please help. No, I'm always looking to get new jokes. Um, every, com every comedian is different. And when I mean every comedian, there are comedians that are alike, but every comedian is different. We all have different acts. Some people do, you know, some people are political, some people are non-political. You know, my act is kind of autobiographical. You know, I call it, here's a big word. I'll give you a big word now. I'm like satirically autobiographical. Like I stretch the truth a little bit. You know, we, we make it funny, try to be relatable, 
try to be self-deprecating. It's really just an extension of my, my personality. And uh, everybody's funny in a different way. But but I I tell young comedians this, and I always tell myself, and I learned this too myself, is, is the line, dance with the girl you brought. In other words, do what got you there and, and you know how good you are a certain way. And don't try to, don't try to waver and be somebody different. And, and, and that's, that's made me better. In other words, I'm confident to know I can be, I can be an am funny in a certain way. And that's the way I roll, you know? Now, how do you create, I mean, you, you write your own material. So is yeah. that something, do you have a process well, for that? I mean, is well, that, you know, do not I, really, you not really. I should it's probably, it's probably, I should be better at that as being the right. I mean, I'm not no great joke writer, you know, I'm not like some, uh, you get an idea, you see something and then you look for punchlines, if you know what I'm talking about. Like if I, oh, if I talk about this, what could be a good, boom, boom, like a good punchline. So, so but, uh, would you say you're more observational? You're like, you're always writing. I mean, you're at the Dunkin' Donuts, you see something funny and boom, in your head, you have a joke. And that, I mean, is that it? Or do you set aside time behind like a computer? No, I should be that. I should do the latter. I used to used to say that. I put aside 20 minutes a day and this and that, but um, definitely observational. Something pops up and you're like, and every comedian, when, as I'm, if there is a comedian watching this, they always, you always hear something, you're like, that's a joke. That's a good one. And you try to say to yourself, what can I say to make it funny on stage, you know? So um, just recently I came up with a new joke and it was just right off the cuff. Someone didn't know I had a nine-year-old son, that I'm 54 with a nine-year-old. And he was complaining that his son still lives in the house. Just talking. He goes, oh, yeah, my son still lives in the house. He's 28. He's got no job. And he goes, how about your son? And I just said, I go, yeah, my son still lives with me. And he goes, well, what's your ex What's his excuse? I said, well, he's in fourth grade. I said, <laughs> I said he's nine. You know, so there's no work. And right there, I'm like, oh, my God. That's a great joke. And I've been using it like for, for a few weeks and it's a great joke. So it's, um, you know, but see, there's the punchline in that. So but all comedians are always looking for those things, but um, always working on that. That's, that's what you got to keep. You got to try to keep writing new jokes. And um, it's the hardest thing to do, actually. And any good, I, I respect all comedians that are really good writers. I always, I'm actually jealous of them. Not jealous, but I, I applaud them and I, um, and I, and it, it inspires me. I like, and I, I aspire to be to, to write because so, you know, some stuff you could do off the cuff, but sometimes the, the, the best comedians, they make it look like they're thinking about it right there. But they're not. They probably sat at their desk for hours, you know, putting it together. So your, is your family, like, terrified every time something happens, like, that, that they're going to wind up in, on stage? <laughs> I think they're kind of used to it. You know, my wife even helps me sometimes. You know, she'll she'll tell me and she'll notice a joke somewhere. And um, No, they're not really terrified. I, I um. In fact, I don't talk about them enough. My family, people go, "You got to talk about your mother," because my mother's a maniac, and I don't talk about her. I, you know, I just really talk about my wife and my kid and me, and you know. But Once I got to work. Well, I'll see something about you write about your mom on a like yeah, Instagram, Facebook, or I do follow you yeah. Yeah, on like social media. Just, like today, she just sent me a screenshot of the weather. Like I'm like, you know, she's 77, sitting home. I remember when COVID started. She goes, "I just want things to get back to normal." I go, "Ma," she goes, "She goes, all I do is sit in the house now." and watch TV and watch the weather. And I'm like, that's all you did before COVID. What are you talking about? I mean, <laughs> nothing's changing. But um, anyway. Yeah, the little families uh, that usually serve, you know, serve as a plethora of, yeah. uh, of information, of observational uh, information for no most doubt. comedians. No so do you have a comedian that you feel, you know, you love, like you want to go see when they're, when they're nearby? Currently, or like oh, all yeah, the time. I guess currently. Well, I mean, I'm going to break my question then into two parts. Do you have mm -hmm. someone you look at and say, "I this is the reason I'm a comedian"? Like I laughed at you know, I can I can remember being a kid and David Brenner was huge, right? He was yeah. on the Tonight Show all the time, and 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 you know, I, you know, you you waited, you know, you couldn't wait when you saw him come up in the TV guy that he was going to be the guest, and you were super mm -hmm. excited. Like, do you have somebody like that in your past that that drew you towards it? And then I would say, who's your favorite comedian now? So it's a, it's a compound question. People people always ask you that when you're a comedian, especially when they know you've been doing it a long time like me. They're like, oh, who's your favorite? I could tell you this. I didn't aspire to be a comedian. Like if you had Seinfeld, you know, he wanted to be a comedian. That's what he always said that. Lived in Long Island, I wanted to be like Alan King. I didn't want, I wanted to be in show business. I wanted to be like acting. I loved watching my favorite entertainers to watch on the Jackie Gleason show. 
the repeats, obviously. I'm, I'm only 54. Right. And my father used to go, that was live television. There was no cut. He did it live. And I'm like, just, I'm like, wow, that's incredible. And I, and I just love how he held an audience. He, you know, he went the suit and the cigarette and the carnation. He was just a presence. I love that. Yeah. And um, so I always wanted to be like that, you know, always wanted to have the talk show and stuff like that. But, you know, so the only, the only quick way to get into the business was through comedy. And one thing about comedy you know, one minute, you know, you're at an open mic at a bar in the city. And then the next minute you could be on a stage big time in front of 300 people. And that's what happens. And you got to sink or swim. And, and fortunately I kept swimming. And, um, so, but, um, but I grew up in the eighties, you know, Eddie Murphy, Rodney Dangerfield, Andrew Dice Clay, those, those were the guys. I love them. To this day, I could hear those guys all the time. Um, you know, Don Rickles, people compare me to Don Rickles, probably the best compliment, my compliment I get is people go, you're an Italian Don Rickles. And I don't try to be, <laughs> but you know, you're doing it, you do it in a cute way when you play with the audience and stuff. But, um, so he was great too. Whoever didn't like him. Um, currently, you know, I like guys. And Sebastian's great. I love Sebastian. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's great. He's His the favorite benchmark. Favorite line too. You know? Yeah, There's a lot benchmark. of Italian stuff too. Yeah, so Italian think that's why we're going. yeah. But once again, rela relatable stuff. He talks about stuff and he stretches the truth and he's brilliant. His, his delivery is great. You know, he's he's hysterical. I love like guys like Nick DiPaolo. He's very political, but I love him. And there's a, you know, there's a slew of people, but yeah. You know. Well, let's talk about, I mean, because you, obviously there's something to being on stage live. I, I mean, that I think satisfies your, when Jackie Gleason did the show and he acted live, there was no cut or redo. Yeah, I don't mean Ralph <laughs> Brandon. It was Jackie. That's the Jackie Gleason show. I, I want to get, I don't mean Ralph, because people think, oh yeah, I love the honeymoon. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean the Jackie Gleason show, but go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. So even, even so, when you're talking about a, a live, uh, a live talk show format where there isn't mm -hmm. a redo, uh, there isn't a cut. Mm -hmm. For you to be attracted to that, I would think the comedy helps feed that for you because there really isn't a redo, right? You're on the stage, you're delivering your material. It's mm -hmm. going to hit with that audience or it's going to flop with that audience. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do when it flops? What do you do when a, when a good joke that works someplace else just does not land? Well, you know, you, you're talking to someone who's been doing it 20 years, you know, it, I'm, I, I don't teach this, but I know what, I just go on to the next joke. You know, sometimes the best laugh you get is when you tell a joke and you say, well, that one worked last night. What's wrong with you people? But um, <laughs> you just go on to the next one. You just go on to the next one. And, uh, you know, have, have, you know, never, never, even if, you know, when I first started, I used to go to some, some mentors of mine that I still talk to this day. And they always used to say, you know, you got to fake it. You know, even if you, you think you're, 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 you're flustered or, you know, you don't, you know, you got to fake it. Just keep forging ahead and because and, you don't want the audience to feel uh, an insecurity. You know, you always got to be in control of that. So um, just go on to the next one. You know, be prepared. Yeah. But, and, and listen, and, and, and if you have success with a joke, you know, then you know it's funny. So if they don't laugh one night, maybe it's the way you said it. Maybe, maybe something happened. But, you know, just go on to the next one. Don't stand there with silence. Silence. Comedians that are an experience get very intimidated by silence. Um, uh, that's a big thing, if they, even if comedians are listening, because sometimes you speed up a joke because the silence can be intimidating. Chris Rock once said this. I hate to bring up this name. We don't have to talk about the Academy Awards, but Chris Rock used to say that sometimes comedians rush a joke because they hear the silence and they want to get to the punchline so they can hear the laughter. But sometimes you take your time and then hit them with the punchline and then the laughter just explodes. But So um, that's it. <laughs> I give no. you the long versions of everything. There's no cliff note <laughs> answers with me, so. <laughs> well, they're probably that, that's true in general, right? Seldom sure. is there a short answer that you can give yeah. that fully answers anything. Um, so when you're on stage now, is there a vibe? Do you feel, because I've heard other people say, oh, yeah. even people who do plays, uh, you oh, know, yeah. there's just an energy that feeds off the audience. Oh, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. There are times there are certain places where sometimes I'll walk into an event and I'll be like, Oh my God, I hope I have my second heart attack. I don't want to, this is going to be torturous. And then there are times where I go in, I'm like, Oh my God, they're, they're going to be so good. I'm in the best spot. I can't wait. And so no doubt. And every comedian will tell you that you go in sometimes you're like, Oh, this, they're, they're ready. You know, they're set up. Sometimes those are the fundraisers and these, you know, just regular middle-class people. You do these fundraisers for people for events and, just great married couples that want to go out on a Saturday night and you're at a Knights of Columbus or a VFW 
they just want to laugh so bad. And those are sometimes you're in the best spots. So yeah, we definitely feel a vibe, no doubt. Do you remember the first time you ever stepped on a stage to perform your billion concert? percent, billion percent? It was Caroline's on Broadway, December 11th, 1999. I remember being backstage and this is the truth. I've told this to my son, too. I remember my hands. I don't know if you can see my hands. They were on the table, and they were flat. I felt paralyzed. My mouth was bone dry. I was so nervous. And I remember one of the hosts looking at me like, hey, you're up soon. And I'm like, I'm glad you can talk right now because I'm so numb. And um, But it took one joke. I walked out. I, I think I looked at the person in front. I said, and I was really, really, not that I'm so skinny now, but I was really, really fat. I said to the lady, if I leave this mic stand here, can you still see me? The audience, it's a, it's a Ray Hawk joke. Comedians, all fat comedians say it. And the audience laughed. And it was like, you know, the blood just rushed all through my body. And it was raw. And I roller skated the rest of the show. But yes, I do remember my first show to this day. December 11th, 1999. Wow. Is that your most memorable moment at this point in your career? Or do you have a most Well, I don't have any, you know, I'm still striving. I still am striving, you know. Um, my father, when he was alive, he was dying to see me on TV. But he's gone now. But I still aspire for that that you know i want to get cast i've never been on tv on network television you know no offense to your podcast but you know I'm, i want to be on you know no. so i don't have any real memorable like i haven't been on jimmy fallon or anything like that but i've had some great events i'm blessed to play the borgata in atlantic city all the time those are some awesome shows when you make a thousand people laugh those are the great those are great shows and um and sometimes when you do some fundraisers for some real sensitive causes and then you know you could be and i mean really sensitive causes and then the people who went through that those issues are, are hugging you after the show, thanking you. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. You know, this lady, like, I don't even want to say, but you know, this lady went through some real grief in her life and she's thanking me for making her laugh. So those are really gratifying times, but, but I don't have that one, you know, I don't have that David Letterman moment. I'm, I'm trying. Come I, on, I, help me out, Tony, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the, the, the beauty of your career, uh, right? That you're, the, the comedy, because mm -hmm. you just never know where people are in their life. And I've said this before on the podcast. You don't know what kind of day they're having. You don't know what trauma or what experience they're having in their life. Mm -hmm. And I think the wonder of comedy is such that you can help that person escape for a little while. Or you can give that person who's maybe whose life is just, you know, tumbling down around them, uh, you know, a, a little bit of, of joy and and that's a gift, right? That that is equally uh, as valuable as any as any other career. I mean, we look yeah. for entertainment when we're, um, you know, yeah. when we're going through bad times in our lives. I mean, I re I remember, and I've said this before too. I, I remember my cancer journey, and um, I I really needed some joy or something to hold on to like i sure. remember you know i needed to know like oh focus like tonight i'm going to be able to watch this sitcom you know what i mean i needed to be able to focus yeah. on something else and and then just spending that little bit of time with uh whether it's a sitcom or a comedian or you can you can just you know try to laugh and get away and i and i think that serves and you know such a valuable uh purpose and i think entertainment the whole career is underrated for exactly that reason. I do think that it serves such a valuable purpose in society. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Every comedian has that little bit of a badge. Like we feel like, uh, you know, the situations we go into, like we were talking before about good situations, if according, you know, we're, 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 we're vested like to do those things. And there's no doubt. I mean, I, I can't even add to what you said. There's, there's no doubt. Like you said, if there were times you went through cancer and you were looking forward to watching something, you know, just like that. there's no doubt I, and, and i've really been feeling it a lot this past year because remember 2020 was basically x'd out of people's lives to socialize and then a good portion of 21 into 22 now you know you know the line where people say oh i've been dying to get out i've been i haven't laughed this much these people really mean it now because they really haven't been out they've been trapped in their houses living in their sheds they haven't known what to do now they're going out and they're, they're seeing, they're, they're laughing, you know, they got the vein popping from their neck. So I really feel their happiness now. This is, and I mean that, you know, when people, because people always say, oh, that was great. I haven't laughed that way in a long time. They really mean it now. It's true. It's the truth. So. Now, let's talk for a while. You were doing the vignettes with Vic, 
Victor Benedetto, a fellow comedian. Uh, and- I'll give you an A for wrestling. But, uh- <laughs> so <we're> like, <laughs> do you pretend? Yeah, okay. You're Italian, Tony. Get it right. You know, this okay. is the second time on the podcast I totally messed up an Italian name. I, I think I'm, I'm Italian. Can you say my real name? Right, you know I'm not born Gooch. I know it's I know, I know, I know, I know you have a long sounding Italian name, and I'm gonna s I am going to do not remember it. Oh, because Marcolini's short. No, it's Gucciardo. Gucciardo, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. But I and, and speaking of December 11th, and I started when I first started, I was going to be Tommy Gucciardo. That's my name. But then everyone was butchering it. They couldn't say it. They were spelling it wrong. And a couple of people that were in the business said, listen, everyone calls you Gooch. Go by Gooch. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I go. If I play, I play softball or baseball, they break down Gooch. So he goes, yeah, go by Gooch. So I've been going by Gooch for 20 plus years. You know, it's not like a stage name. It's just if you know me five minutes, you're going to call me Gooch anyway. So I go by Tommy Gooch. But um, I tell people, listen, if you want to cast me in something and pay me, you can call me Cleopatra. I don't care what you call me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was Di Batetto. Yeah, I used to do those vignettes with him. He's a, he's a great act. He's doing well. Um, I haven't worked with him a long time. But those vignettes were really funny. Those, those vignettes, vignettes were fun. Best of time. Yeah, natural yeah. stuff. Did you ever they think were... about continuing to do vignettes? I know you only did it that, sh- that short period of time. Yeah. No, I, I really... I should do more of that, you know. I should do more of that uh, exploitation, so to speak. But um, I, yeah, I do a little Facebook and a little Instagram and a little Twitter, but I really don't do those kind of like, you know, out of the box things. I mean, if someone was doing it, and I, I, I'm not the leader of those things. I was great as a little sidekick for those things. Yeah. Well, to you're more you 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 know you need the the, the stage presence. It sounds like. Uh... You, you, mean? Mean, you know, or or a good script, right? I, other TV show, yeah. you know, or yeah. yeah, a good script. And um, well, like I said, if someone was, if I was with another comedian, he was doing a video, I would be hysterical in it. But I, I'm not the kind of guy who's just driving to my show and say, "Hey, oh, look, I'm in uh, Oneonta. Look at this." I don't, I don't do that. That's not me. But I, I'm great. I'm just not the uh, the starter of it. That's all. No. Did you do you ever ever write any material as you go? You ever been on stage? I'm curious. Uh, and have yeah, some of my jokes I've actually thought of on stage came to me real quick. To this day, I use a couple of one-liners, and it actually like happened on stage. I didn't even write it. It just your mind, comedians' minds. Any comedian listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you, you got gears in your head. You're telling a joke, and you're actually thinking of the joke that's coming. And yeah, sometimes, sometimes, not often, but sometimes. Yeah. Well, that sounds interesting to me. I think. I mean, for me, my experience is very different. You know, my background is is law, really. And um, so in the courtroom, even though it may come off as a very natural conversation that we're having with questions, I, you know, I've prepared for some time, uh, you know, to be able to do that. So, I, you know, I, I know where we're going. I know, every, you know, everything I, I want to get out of the person before I start questioning them. Uh, and so it's very different than I think your experience where you have a lot of room to ad lib. I mean, because I remember you ad libbing when we were filming the pilot. Well, that was because uh, I forgot the lines, Tony. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> never, no. admit, never admit that, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, I forgot the lines. But uh, yeah, no, there's a lot of ad libbing on stage. Listen, sometimes I forget. Sometimes I'll tell my wife I got two new jokes, blah, blah, blah. I'll come home and she'll be like, did you say those two new jokes? I go, no, I forgot them. I forgot to do them, and but I but I ad lib two other things. So there's a lot of ad lib. Community, yeah, a lot of communities do a lot of ad lib on stage, off the cuff, so to speak. Now, is your favorite genre comedy? If you're going to watch a movie, or what, what was you? What's your favorite? I mean, that this is interesting because I've I've had writers whose favorite genre is different than what they write. <laughs> um. I'm I'm a weird apple on this though, Tony. I get made fun of. All. I don't watch movies. Listen, I'm, you know, I, I'm channel surfing. Don't get me wrong. The Godfather, of course, I'm gonna watch it. You know, what I'm saying I, that stuff like that. Um, you know, if, if I'm channel surfing, and Shawshank Redemption's on, I love that. But I'm I'm not a big movie guy. You know, um, I'm just you know, I, I, yeah, I, I love. You watch you watching but, sports, right? I I'm a sports that. guy. Yeah, I, yeah. I watch, you know, football base. Yeah, I definitely love sports. But um, you know what I could do now? I, what I've been doing lately is sometimes if I'm, you know, the, through the uh, advance of technology, I'll go on my smart TV and I'll watch. Uh, I'll go on YouTube 
and watch stuff on YouTube instead of channel surfing because I don't even care for what's on TV, you know? So I do that sometimes, but... um, I hear that a lot. Uh, yeah. A lot of people saying that they're not as invested in the shows of today. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, I am not at all invested today. I mean, I used to like American Idol years ago. Now I really don't. Um, you know, I really, I really, even I even have trouble now. You ready for this? I have trouble watching shows. <coughs> excuse me, that I liked years ago because it's so far fetched and and technology has advanced so much. I'm like, oh, it couldn't even have happened. You know, what I'm saying like the movie The Fugitive was great. And now I'm like, that couldn't happen today. They'd spot them in four seconds. There'd be 90 cameras. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, I, I go, I watch Friends now. I'm like, how did I get into Friends? Uh, these kids are all broke. They were living in an apartment in the city worth three grand a month. How do you do it? It's ridiculous. How did I get so into this? It's stupid. So I even have trouble watching stuff that I liked years ago. So um, It's funny but, you say that. I, you know, I have, I was watching something the other day. And I had, and, and the person had to keep finding a, a phone, you know, a public phone to, you know, to call in or give their secretary like, oh, oh I'll be here and there and like give a phone number for different locations. And I thought, wow, <laughs> right. We're so used to, you just get the person on their cell phone, wherever they are. It's, yeah. it, 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 it seems so weird. There's video and, cameras everywhere. I mean, you, you, there's security cameras at every traffic light. So, you know, you, so you know what I'm talking about it. That doesn't mean you can't watch it, but I look back and I'm like, oh, it can never happen. It's impossible. There's no way. So, yeah. Sure. And I think that is an interesting point with The Fugitive, right? There's a, a book about, uh, uh, you know, after uh, John Wilkes Booth ki uh, shot or killed uh, Lincoln, right? That he goes on the run uh, and he's able to, you know, travel through several states. And uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting book about that, you know, that whole thing. And you're thinking in the in the world today, that would never be possible, right? Yeah. It'd <laughs> never be possible to just like- Won't be able to get out of the state. I mean, let alone, I mean, we will not get out of town. You know, he won't be able to get to the next traffic light. There's cameras everywhere. We talk about OJ. I hate to bring up OJ, you know, that guy, we know what he did and then went home. There were, there were there were traffic lights everywhere now. You they'd be able to trace where his car was and for you know what I'm saying. So it's just so different. It's so different. Right. And your cell phone is just pinging, tracked <laughs> everywhere, pinging locations that they're able to track everywhere, you. Everywhere. The world yeah. is definitely different. So I agree with you. I think that some there's something about watching old, older TV shows um, that does feel a little, you know, a little out of touch. But you know what? Sometimes the stories are really well written. Like I can still, it, in the middle of the night, I can still watch a good episode of Mannix. And even though it's dated and, and the like, uh -huh. the stories are very well written. The idea uh -huh. of the, the, the crime is very well crafted. Or Oh, yeah. I could watch a good Quincy once in a while. I could watch that. Remember Quincy with Jack Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I love you. That. I used to watch that. And don't I, get me wrong. Listen to me. On New Year's Day, I'm watching The Honeymooners and The Odd Couple. I mean, that's... You, Listen, you can get me all in the family twenty four seven. Okay, so don't get me wrong about that. Let's 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 let me let me retract a little bit. Okay, those well, you were talking classics. Okay, Happy Days. Like who can? My son loves Fonzie. He's nine. So yes, don't get me wrong. There's the classics. So I mean, yeah, I we had we had um, Donnie Most on the on the podcast. Him. Sings now. Well, not now. Yeah. He always sang, but now he sings. Yeah, he really sings. I mean, I remember talking to him about that, exactly that. I mean, you didn't sing on the show. Usually, uh, he sang a little bit. He sang a little bit. Did he? I he mean, I remember yeah. Anthony Williams was doing this. Oh, yeah. Potsy, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But usually you saw him kind of in the background. And he said, that's kind of how it got set up. Like, even though he could sing because Anthony Williams was the guy who was going to be doing the singing, they really didn't give him any opportunities, but he was able to sing a few songs. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was so interesting to me that he said from the pilot, he felt it. You know, he felt the energy of that show that it was going to go on and be a success right from mm -hmm. the one. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, and it really was. I mean, it was a block until today. I mean, can you anticipate being involved in something that, you know, 50 years later, people are still tuning into and love it? Yeah, that was my favorite show. That was Tuesday nights, 8 o'clock. With mom yeah. and dad, those are the days. Yeah, I actually do a joke in my act about that. My, uh, I'll paraphrase it. Where, you know, life was just so different. Like, oh, we're going a thousand miles an hour. Now. Like, I mean, 
one minute I'm, I'm with my son at school. The next minute on a Tuesday night, I'm in the diner with him. And I'm like, I never went to the diner with my father on a Tuesday. It was a school night. We went, we watched happy days and we went to sleep. That's how simple life was. Now we're going a thousand miles an hour every day. And so life is really different. But um, yeah, those shows, those shows were great. all in the family. You talk about knowing it. They didn't know it then. That show flopped its first season. And then it went into syndication. They played reruns and it exploded. And those shows yeah. were the best. Yeah, this happy days. All the characters. Day. Some of those characters, I think, are among the greatest ever created, arguably, like Hawkeye and Mash and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Archie Bunker. A lot yeah, of those the writers are even more brilliant. The writers show you how brilliant they are because what happens was happens is that the characters, even if, and this happened in Friends too. If you watch the pilot of legendary, you get when you get legendary sitcoms, watch the pilot and watch how different it is. Because what happens is that the characters, they develop their character and then the writers write within that character. You know what I'm saying? Carol O'Connor wasn't, he wasn't full throttle Archie that first season, you know? But then it got successful and then they, they wrote more parts for the way he acted and then it exploded. You know what I'm saying? Even Edith, if you watch Jean Stapleton, she wasn't all, you know, all Archie. She wasn't like that that first season. It's just, you know, they evolved. The characters evolved. Well, I, I, I've said, and again, this is something I say all the time, I think creativity is very collaborative, uh, mm -hmm. for, especially for film and television, mm -hmm. because there's the writer who creates, you know, the characters in the story on paper. And then there's the actors who come in and breathe life into the paper version. Right? Uh -huh. And then there's the cinematographer who knows the angles to capture, uh, you know, uh -huh. that, that, that best tell the visual story. Uh, uh -huh. And then there's the editor who knows the right take, you know, to put in. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I, by the time you're done, right, and then the, the, mu the music, right, the music director who comes in and knows what music to synchronize to the, I think by the time you go from the first, you know, to, you know click of the, of the computer, to the, seeing it, so many hands have been in creating that project to be what it uh -huh. is. And then uh -huh. that's one of the true forms that creativity, I think, is truly collaborative. Because if you sit and write a book, there's something very isolating about that, right? It's just you behind uh -huh. your computer typing away. And uh, for the most part, you're creating a world that'll never exist off of that piece of paper. Uh, you may uh -huh. have an editor come in and clean it up, but yeah, but, uh -huh. it's, yeah, but it's mostly the, a world you created uh, isolated. Whereas the, the film industry and the television, I, I just think it's so collaborative to get to the final yeah. result uh, that I'm always fascinated by that. All the hands along the way really have to be, um, you know, the best yeah. they can be to make it, you know, to make it what it is. And I think actors do have a difficult job. Uh, you know, you were, I mean, I remember you just being on the set even with you when we were filming Surviving Sam, right? It's a difficult job to read a paper version of you. Mm. But then you bring life to it. You bring the quirks, right? And the is yeah, that make that person who they are. Not just me. Uh, thank you. But like, so in other words, the writer writes the part and then the actor, comedian, whatever, we bring life into what you wrote, right? And then you like the way we do it. And then you write again with the character that I just showed you. So you're, and you see what I'm saying? And, and we just keep evolving that way. So that's, I know exactly what you're talking about. Crystal Chappelle was on the show and she said that uh, when she was on Guiding Light, sometimes she'd be a little sarcastic with an ad lib. Uh, mm -hmm. And then eventually they started writing her character more, like sarcastic, uh, mm -hmm. just based upon what were her, her few ad libs because it really yeah. seemed to work for the character. So I think that's evolved, kind of exactly, evolved, yeah. yeah. That's exactly what you're saying. Right. Um, you know, and I, I thought you, you, know, you said you forgot your lines, but uh, I thought you ad libbed, you know, in filming Surviving Sam and, and brought yeah. a different side uh, to that character that it would have been really fun to write for, boy, to continue. Well, it's going to be mad again. I'm telling you, Tony, that was, I still talk about it to this day. It was great. Maybe sometime again. It was a great concept. To whoever's listening, it was about a divorce couple where the judge makes them live together as a divorce couple. It's hysterical. And the brother-in-law, me, got along with the ex-husband. It was hysterical. And Rob was great, another comedian. He was so funny. But what are you going to do? Yeah, it was... Next, next life. <laughs> if I was famous, I'd have a coffee mug of water, but instead I got my little bottle of water. Here. Yeah. It goes down just the same. Yes. 
So <laughs> tell me what you have planned coming up now. I mean, oh. you're on tour, I think. I've been seeing lots well, of dates come up. Yeah, well, I wouldn't call it a tour. But, you know, I, I've been calling it the past year. has been like a resuscitation of our career. You know, I mean, basically from March of 20 till March of 21, it was dead zone. And around April, May of last year, it's been about a year of getting things back in order. And um, just people being able to socialize and going out. We had a lot of cancellations. You know, people would book an event and then they go, oh, nobody wants to go out. People want to do the show outdoors and in carports. And that was hard. But um, we're just trying just trying to fill the schedule and get dates and work and get back in order. You know, get my life. It's been a real tough time for, for the entertainers, you know. Um, just trying to resuscitate our careers. Just trying to get it going again. I yeah I mean that's probably just as true for uh, for entertainment entertainment business as it is for any field that really took a hit uh, yeah. for COVID because if there's I mean you didn't re- I didn't even think about it beforehand but that's how you generate your your livelihood I mean you yeah. perform and my wife's a tra- and my wife's a travel agent too so it was like a double whammy. Right. When, when people yeah. stay in, I mean, they're not traveling, they're not going out to clubs and all those professions, you know, are affected by that. The owners, the waiters, the, you know, the performers. Trickle down, trickle down yeah. Sure. It trickles down and everybody was affected. So uh, I'm glad to see the world, you know, opening up again uh, so that everyone can kind of get back to work. There were some comedians and people who moved to uh, try to figure out ways I guess to keep things going online, uh, right? By doing yeah, I'd rather get a root canal. Those are tough. <laughs> I get one or two of them. I mean, listen, you talked about this earlier about feeling the vibe. You know, when you're a comedian. You need to get a live laughter to do it to crack a joke and hear crickets and silence. Uh, like I said, I'd rather get a root canal. Thank God those are over with, pretty much. You need well, you need the energy. You have to feed off boy, the energy. Come on. It was crazy. It's so stupid. I mean, I'll do a talk show like this or a podcast, but not say, oh, there's 20 people listening. Tell us jokes. Come on. <sighs> Gotta hit a laughter. There's a delay. I forget about it. Then you're telling the joke and you see little squares of people and they're looking at their phone. Oh my God. How do you think you'd be an acting drama? I'd be good in anything. Exploit me. <laughs> 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 and it was I'm, ready for, folks. <laughs> I'm ready for all love scenes anything you want i'm good for it. <laughs> that's i you know what i th- i think i i think i agree with you just a little a bit of acting i saw you do uh while there was comedy to it i i think you know you did a, a little a little bit of dr- drama i think lish's character gets a call that her husband uh is in the hospital she goes running out and there's just like a little bit of a moment there uh, which you could see with so much untapped potential in you. Oh, thank uh, you. That was great. Oh, what a great, pro- what a great, great time. So anyway, I'm gonna agree. I'm gonna agree that I think you'd be good at almost anything. Thank you, thank you, Tony. You're a sweetheart. So tell people where they can find uh, information about you, where they can find oh, where you're gonna be. Thank you. Um, um, follow me on all social media. It's Tommy Gooch. TommyGooch.com. Um, friend me on Facebook. I have a fan page, Twitter, Instagram. I got some good shows coming up. If there's any Long Island fans, I'll be at the Patch Oak Theater in April, April 15th, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm waiting on a date. I'll be at the Borgata in Atlantic City in a couple of months. Um, just come see me. Just come see me live. I, I have all um, all my public events are on my website. I'm in social media. Come see me. That's the only that that's what I would love. Come see me live. Enjoy your show. So we're going to put links in the comments below. I think your website is TommyGooch.com. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yep, yes. up and running. Yeah. Yep. So uh, we'll put links to everything uh, in the comments below so you can check him yep. out. If he, Certainly if he's, if he's performing near you, go see yep. him. Uh, I have seen him. He's very funny. He's a very funny person in real life as well as on mm. the stage. So. Thank Good. you. So on that note, we're going to close out the podcast. Thank you, Tommy, for coming on. Thank you for having me, Tony. It was nice to see you. Nice to talk to you. You look great. I hope you feel as good as you look, and um, we'll stay in touch. You got it. Bye, everyone.